It's great to see everybody here today. It's always a highlight to be able to meet with the Lord's people and rejoice in hearing of Christ. I wouldn't want to be anywhere anywhere else. Let's take our course books and turn to page number nine. We're going to sing this together to begin our time of worship. How great thou art. O Lord most high, thou holy God and Savior, thy power and might are more than tongue can tell. But greater far the love that bought salvation and saved the lost from sin and death and hell. O God of love, O God of Calvary, how great thou art, how great thou art in all the world. There is no one like thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. Once far from God. An alien and a stranger. Of hope bereft. A sinner lost and lone. But Jesus came to rescue from the danger to give us life he sacrificed his own O god of love O god of calvary how great thou art how great thou art in all the world there is no one like thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. In mercy rich, in love and grace abounding. When we were dead in trespasses and sins, thine only Son, for us was freely given. How great thou art, in thee our life begins. O God of love, O God of Calvary, how great thou art, how great thou art, in all the world, there is no one like thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. The world likes to talk about a God of love, but he's only the God of love because he's the God of Calvary. That's how he has loved sinners, those he gave his son for whom Christ came and paid the debt. Other than that, He's not a God of love. He's a God of justice, condemnation. So if we can sing that, how great thou art, it's because he's been pleased to reveal the finished work of Christ, the one who died in our souls. Robert's coming to read it for us. Good morning. Good morning. The Lord is great to those who believe. Psalm 123, unto thee lift I up my eyes, O thou that dwellest in the heavens, behold, as the eyes of servants look unto the hand of their masters, and as the eyes of a maiden unto the hand of her mistress, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God, until that he have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy upon us, for we are exceedingly filled with contempt. Our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorning of those that are at ease and with the contempt of the proud. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for the word, for your word is Christ. Lord, you have shown us that our hearts are desperately wicked and we need a Savior. We ask that you forgive us. Lord, today religion makes the gospel out of, for man, but the gospel from Revelations to Genesis. Genesis to Revelation is about the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Lord, we thank you for your mercy and we thank you for your grace. We look to you today in Christ's name, I pray. Amen. Well, let's take our bulletin and on inside cover, we'll sing this to the tune of, oh, worship the King. We gather this day to honor the King who sits on his throne. His triumphs we sing. The Savior who died to pay for our sin came forth from the tomb and he liveth again. Christ Jesus our Lord, he liveth has won. He died and arose. The work is all done. He took on himself all our debt to repay. The sins of his people are all washed away. To Jesus our Lord, all honors we bring and say unto death, Oh, where is thy sting? Enthroned in his glory, almighty to save. King Jesus has triumphed o'er sin and the grave. He rose from the tomb, he reigns high above. All praise to his name, all power and love. Made righteous in Jesus, we someday shall rise to dwell with our Savior above earth and skies. That's a great hymn. Summarizes the gospel of Christ. And Bob's coming to read for us. Good morning. Hebrews chapter 10. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers, once they purged, should have no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh, when he cometh unto the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above, uh, and when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sin thou wouldst not, neither hast pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O, o God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering, and oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Whereof of the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, 
This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and their minds I will write them. And their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the matter of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully, after that which we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for the judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despises Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden under the underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done this despot unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth to me, and I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But call to remembrance the former days in which, after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions. Partially, partly, whilst ye were made a grazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. For ye had compassion of me in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoils of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and enduring substance. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great re recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and that shall come, will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back into perdition, but of them that believeth to the saving of the soul. May we pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the word that we read, dear Lord. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, sitting on the right-hand side of the Father. All sins are forgiven through our Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. When people want to argue about salvation, Hebrews 10 would be a good place to send them. And I always want to say, what part of one sacrifice, one offering, one shed blood don't you understand? But it takes the Spirit of God to bring our hearts to bow and not look anywhere else. And thankfully he has for some of us. Some may be still sitting here and arguing, thinking somewhere else at my faith or through my works or zeal, all that. It takes the Lord opening your eyes. That's all I know. I was once of that number that pursued pretty zealously other 
ways of looking at salvation. And I'll tell you what, if the Lord ever strikes you with an arrow, it'll kill you dead on the spot. And I'm thankful he, he did. Open my eyes when I came to, it was looking to Christ alone, looking for peace only in that shed blood accomplished at Calvary. People that argue elsewhere, they, they've never been lost. Because if they've been lost, they know one thing, but Christ. That's it. Christ came crucified. Thankful to be able to rejoice around him today. He hideth my soul. 258. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. A wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand. And covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. He taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up, and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. That shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. With numberless blessings each moment he crowns, and filled with his fullness divine, I sing in my rapture, O oh, glory to God, for such a Redeemer as mine. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. When clothed in his brightness, transported I rise to meet him in clouds up the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. David's coming to read for us. Exodus chapter 40. 
And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, On the first day of the first month shalt thou set up the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. Thou shalt put therein the ark of the testimony, and cover the ark with the veil. And thou shalt bring in the table, and set in order the things that are to be set in order upon it. And thou shalt bring in the candlestick, and light the lamps thereof. And thou shalt set the altar of gold for the incense before the ark of the testimony, and put the hanging of the door to the tabernacle. And thou shalt set the altar of the burnt offering before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. And thou shalt set the laver between the tent of the congregation and the altar, and shalt put water therein. And thou shalt set up the court round about, and hang up the hanging at the court gate. And thou shalt take the anointing oil, and anoint the tabernacle, and all that is therein. And thou shalt hallow it, and all the vessels thereof, and it shall be holy. And thou shalt anoint the altar of the burnt offering, and all his vessels, and sanctify the altar, and that shall be an altar most holy. And thou shalt anoint the laver in his foot, and sanctify it. And thou shalt bring Aaron and his sons into the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and wash them with water. And thou shalt put upon Aaron the holy garments, and anoint him, and sanctify him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And thou shalt bring his sons, and clothe them with coats. And thou shalt anoint them, as thou didst anoint their father that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. For their anointing shall surely be an everlasting priesthood throughout their generations. Thus did Moses, according to all that the Lord commanded him, so did he. It came to pass in the first month, in the second year, on the first day of the month, that the tabernacle was reared up. And Moses reared up the tabernacle, and fastened his sockets, and set up the boards thereof, and put in the bars thereof, and reared up his pillars, and he spread abroad the tent over the tabernacle, and put the covering of the tent above upon it, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he took and put the testimony into the ark, and set the staves on the ark, and put the mercy seat above upon the ark. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle, and set up the veil of the covering, and covered the ark of the testimony, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he put the table in the tent of the congregation, upon the side of the tabernacle northward, without the veil. And he set the bread in order upon it before the Lord, as the Lord had commanded Moses. And he put the candlestick in the tent of the congregation, over against the table on the side of the tabernacle southward. And he lighted the lamps before the Lord, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he put the golden altar in the tent of the congregation before the veil. And he burnt sweet incense thereon, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he set up the hanging at the door of the tabernacle, and he put the altar of the burnt offering by the door of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation and offered upon it the burnt offering and the meat offering as the Lord commanded Moses. And he set the laver between the tent of the congregation and the altar and put water there to wash with all. And Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and their feet thereat. When they went into the tent of the congregation and when they came near unto the altar, they washed as the Lord commanded Moses. And he reared up the court around about the tabernacle and the altar and set up the hanging of the court gate. So Moses finished the work. Now a cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. When the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud were not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire was on it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. Father, when Moses finished the work, your glory entered into the tent. When Christ finished his work, he sent his spirit to his chosen people. Give us understanding by the spirit as Ken preaches the gospel of Christ. Amen. Imagine a group of people gathered over a million strong, some think even two million, that the Lord brought out of Egypt, out in the middle of a wilderness, desert, and now gathered around a very simple looking tent. I'm sure that there would have been many in seeing that have wondered, have these people gone nuts, left a land of plenty in Egypt and brought out into a wilderness 
to set up a tent and be assembled around that tent and call that worship. But that's exactly how the Lord purposed it. And so I've entitled this particular message, God's Blueprint for Worship. It doesn't look anything like what people call worship today. The big cry today is for contemporary worship. Big buildings, big budgets, big buses. And uh, that's what they think is worship. But here they are out in the middle of the wilderness. I've often said that if there were no other place to worship than at the end of a dirt road in a cornfield, but if Christ was proclaimed there, that's where I want to be. And uh, that's what we're seeing here. Now, it's like they say, it's taken us a minute to get through Exodus. Uh, maybe David can tell us exactly. He keeps track of how long, when it started and all that. But it's been a journey for us, for me, studying through this. And now we come to the final chapter. If you flip over and think, oh, let's see, oops, next is Leviticus. And yes, we're going to continue on into Leviticus because that's where you get into the details of the sacrifices and all that they had as far as types and pictures of our Lord Jesus Christ. When people ask me, how can you study all that Old Testament? It's not old when Christ is revealed. It's new and fresh because... It's a picture book. And who doesn't like to look at picture books? That's why when you buy magazines, uh, what's the first thing you flip through? You might see some titles, but you're looking at the pictures and get an idea from then what you would really want to know. Well, this That's what God has done. He's given us a picture book of his son. That's what John wrote. He said, this is the record that God has given of his son. So if you read this and study this just for history, it makes good history, but you'll be no better off than the Pharisees that love their history, love to hear the stories of how they were heirs of Abraham according to the flesh and yet miss Christ. We don't want to miss Christ. I don't. And so I've simply divided this up into three parts because that's exactly how it's divided up. When we're looking at God's blueprint for worship, first of all, we have in verses 1 to 15, the instructions given to Moses for setting up the tabernacle. And if you go back and compare from the beginning, when the Lord began to tell Moses how this tabernacle was to be built, and then you read here in this final chapter how he built it, Nothing had changed down to the very detail. It was exactly as God had said it from the beginning. That's what I love about the word of God. Time has passed. And yes, we have the Old and the New Testament, but nothing has changed. It's still what God said from the beginning, how he was to be worshiped. Maybe the form of worship has changed for us today, but we still worship God as he said he should be worshiped from the beginning. We have a tabernacle. Who's the tabernacle? That's Christ. We have an altar. Who's the altar? It's Christ. It's not down in front of this lectern here. It's Christ. We have the laver of water in which those that entered in to serve the high priest in that tabernacle washed before they entered in. What's that? Christ, our sanctification. And we have, as mentioned here, I don't know if when you read that about the altar of incense, it says there in verse 3, set the altar of gold for the incense before the ark of the testimony. There was that inner sanctuary and then a veil and then the holiest of holies. And this altar of gold incense put right there before the veil. That sweet incense that filled that tabernacle. Some say, well, there were probably practical reasons why there was incense because that old skin, those old badger skins in the sun could probably get smelling pretty bad. 
But the Lord didn't ordain it for practical reasons. It was to represent the sweet offerings of the Lord Jesus Christ, the coals that were taken off of the altar of burnt offering out in the in the courtyard that are mentioned there and brought in and used to cause those sweet incense, that sweet incense to go up before the Lord. All that's a type and picture of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the altar, the Ark of the Covenant, where the gold lid laid on top of the what was the Ark underneath in which was put the law and the manna eventually. And Aaron's rod as we go on in time. But that was the mercy seat. Who does that represent? The Lord Jesus Christ. We have all that today. We just don't have it in form. And so these instructions here to Moses didn't change from beginning to end. You say, well, how long were they sitting there to this point? Well, we know it was one year from the time of the Passover back there in uh, the bringing out of them, them out from Egypt with the Passover land to now, it had been one year because verse one or verse two says, on the first day of the first month, thou shalt set up the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. And you say, well, what first month? First day of the first month. Well, when we were reading there in verse 17, and it came to pass in the first month in what? the second year. So all of this detail is significant. This was the anniversary of their deliverance from Egypt. And God purposed that it be on this anniversary of the Passover, of their deliverance from Egypt, that this tabernacle be erected and everything put in place. What a glorious anniversary. I'll tell you again, for those of us that are the Lord's and for whom he paid the debt, our anniversary is the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where this tabernacle was set up. God became flesh in the person of Christ. Everything set in place right on down to the offering up of the Lamb of God and his shed blood on behalf of his people. So this chapter here, and this is the section, verses 1 through 15, that's the first part if you just like to put things in order. Moses, having been instructed to set up the tabernacle, he did so in every way. The Lord didn't tell Moses, just get it built and go ahead and put the furniture where you'd like, whatever makes you happy. That's the way people think of it today, but that's not the case. Even the placement as to where things were to go was specific. He couldn't decide to put the Ark of the Covenant up here up front and then put the, I like the incense altar back in the back as if someone's setting up a house. There's a reason in the order of the placement of these things. And I believe that the further in the high priest got into this tabernacle, the closer he got to that which was the most vital to God, and that was that mercy seat. Why do I say that? It's because that's where the cloud of glory resided, over that mercy seat. That's what people saw from the outside. What part of this tabernacle would have been the most significant to God? All of it was significant. But it's as if, as you went in further into the tabernacle, every part requiring sacrifice, but when you got there, all of a sudden, that's what represented the very presence of God. And I'll tell you, I, that's, that's where I want to be because God is a consuming fire. And unless we can enter in through the one sacrifice and one offering of the Lord Jesus Christ, there's no enjoying of his presence. People hoop to doing and shouting like they've got something to get excited about being in God's presence. Someone asked me one time, he said, well, don't you think the spirit's there? There is a spirit in all of this excitement, but it's not the spirit of Christ. Because where the spirit of Christ is, there is a sobriety in how we approach 
and a wonderment in the fact that we can even approach, as the writer of the Hebrews says, let us come boldly under the throne of grace. What's that throne of grace? That's Christ, our mercy seat, just like these that would have entered in, aware that they were in the presence of God, but not taking it lightly, but nonetheless approaching, knowing that that's where God has purposed to show mercy. That's why it's called the mercy seat. It's because of what Christ has done. So every part, the placement of the Ark of the Covenant, the table, the bread, the, the show bread, that, that means ordered bread. It was set up exactly as God declared, the lampstand, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering. That was out front, the, the basin, the laver for washing. Each item arranged, I would say, meticulously, exactly as God purposed. And when they moved that tabernacle, it was made to move. When they were told to break it down and that cloud began to move and the people were to follow him even further into the wilderness, when they set it back up, it wasn't a new design. It wasn't to be, well, let's, we don't know how long we're going to stay here, so let's just move stuff around to where it's easy to get. No, everything had to be set up meticulously as God had purposed. And I believe that's vital even in our worship. We don't start again every time we meet with something new. We come back to the foundation. We come back to who Christ is. We come back to what his work accomplished. And therein we see everything in its place. I love reading the scriptures for that reason, how it pertains to Christ, how it pertains to his death. And uh, that's our anchor. So Moses then was instructed to do what? Anoint the tabernacle and all its furnishings. You see that in verse 10, thou shalt anoint every part of it, the altar burnt offering, all the vessels, and sanctify the altar, and it shall be an altar most holy, Thou shalt anoint the laver and his foot and sanctify it. Thou shalt anoint, thou shalt anoint, thou shalt anoint. What does the name Christ mean? It means the anointed one. That ought to be a clue that every one of these articles pertain to Christ, the anointed one. When he sanctified them and set them apart, it's every bit as much as Christ said, I sanctify myself for them. People running around today thinking sanctification is something they do. Clean themselves up and make themselves presentable to a holy God. How on earth are you going to do that? When even our righteousnesses are as filthy rags before him. Oh, how we need the sanctified one, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. How we need his sanctifying work, which is what he accomplished there at Calvary. And so... What a delight. You know, we read over these things pretty lightly, don't we? Okay, what's the next detail? But think, stop, stop and pause. Anointed, anointed, anointed. If the Lord had said it one time, it would be sufficient to catch our attention. But over and over, who is this about? Not what it's about, but who is this about? Christ, the anointed one. And how God has purposed to deal with a very wretched and sinful people in the presence, in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Especially when you get down to verse 13 that we read there. Aaron and his sons were then to be brought to the entrance. This is called the tabernacle or the tent of the meeting. This was the place where God had purposed to meet with his people, but not without a mediator. Do you realize even in glory, those of us that, will have the privilege of being there if the Lord is merciful and gracious. It will only be through the mediator. He'll continue to be that lamb slain and that will be the song sung throughout eternity. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. There'll never be a time, even in a glorified state where we could ever say, okay, we no longer need the mediator. That temple, that place that tent of meeting is Christ always is always will be and they then were washed with water 
They were dressed in those sacred garments. It says there in verse 15, thou shalt anoint them. That's a picture of the anointing of not only Christ, but you remember Christ made of his people a kingdom of priests forever. There were the Levites and the priests, and then there were the high priests, and the Levites and priests served the high priests, but all were anointed together in that one anointing. And that's what John wrote about when he spoke of the Lord's people having this anointing. Who is that anointing? It's Christ. And that's how we're accepted in him. Thou shalt anoint, verse 15, them as thou didst anoint their father, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. That's the believers. That's the elected ones. They, or we, if we're in him, have been anointed, even as he was anointed as being a sent of God, that they or we may minister unto me in the priest's office. Not even that has changed today. If you're one of the lords for whom Christ paid the debt, you are ministering unto Christ the high priest right now. In song, I don't know if you thought about that in singing, but the songs that we sing, they, they reflect the very gospel we believe. And who hears those songs it's the lord god himself rejoicing in hearing us that have been delivered by the son of god and by his grace singing praise unto him offering unto him the lips of praise so all of that is still the same today but dressed in those sacred garments what's our dressing what's our sacred garment it's certainly not our filthy rags it's the very imputed righteousness of Christ that is reflected here in this consecration. When it says in verse 13, thou shalt put upon Aaron the holy garments, anoint him and sanctify him. That's Christ in that righteousness that he came and earned and established and God imputed that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. There would be no place for the rest of us had not been that Christ was the one appointed and anointed to minister unto God. And thou shalt bring his sons and clothe them with coats, and then thou shalt anoint them as thou didst, didst anoint their father, that they may minister unto me. And look what it says, for their anointing shall surely be an everlasting priesthood throughout all their generations. You might say, well, now wait a minute, what happened to that priesthood? Really got changed it got moved to christ here again it was a blueprint in type and picture and prophecy and promise but now it is everlasting because christ has finished the work and those for whom he paid the debt are forever sanctified i don't have to get up today and think well, i better straighten out my garment a little bit here press it a little bit and think that somehow i gotta fix it up no nope. It's ever as clean and pressed as it'll ever be. Why? Because it's not my garment. It's the garment of the Lord Jesus Christ, imputed. And that's how Paul writes about it there in Ephesians, that he presents us to God as a, a garment of people without spot or without blemish. I know that's tough for us to even think about, isn't it? Because we know our sin. We feel it. I do. You get up every day with bad breath spiritually. I mean, it's just, you know, in ourselves, there's nothing that could make us acceptable before God. But, oh, to be anointed in him through his work. So that's what we see there in verses 1 to 15, God's instructions for setting up the tabernacle. Every detail vital for an everlasting priesthood. That's Christ. And then the next natural division in here is verses 16 to 33 where Moses sets up the tabernacle. That's the connection. The verse, first 15 verses were the instructions which were the same as what he'd been given before as to how every article was to be made. But now verse 16, 
down to verse 33, we have the actual setting up. And verse 16 really is the cornerstone. Thus did Moses, according to all that the Lord commanded him, so did he. Who was Moses a representative of? He was a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there it is again, the blueprint. What Moses was in type, and uh, certainly faulty as a type, yet in the who he represented, no fault. Had Moses been actually perfect, it would not have been necessary for Christ to come. But it's just like a blueprint. Once the building is built, what do you do with the blueprint? You roll it up and you put it away. You don't keep it out and keep showing people the blueprint. You welcome him into the house. Let him see the house that has been built. Well, that's what we do. The Old Testament is the blueprint. But Christ has fulfilled it. And now the house in which we dwell is his house. And because Christ did everything that the Lord commanded, that's why we can have some peace and assurance of being justified before God. It's in his work. It's not in ours. So here in verses 16 to 33, Moses follows God's commands precisely. People ask, why do you have to be so precise? Well, it's because it has to do with the glory of Christ. That's why. With every detail. And Moses assembled the tabernacle as instructed. It's like Christ overseeing his church, his temple, that it be exactly as God the Father purposed. And therefore he placed that ark in the Holy of Holies. And then he screened it off by the curtain and then placed the table, the lampstand, the altar of incense, all set in their designated places in the holy place. There was the holiest of holies where the ark rested and there was the holy place. It's all holy under the Lord. And then the altar of burnt offering. So it's as if it started in the inner part and worked back out toward the main courtyard where the altar of burnt offering was positioned at the entrance of the tabernacle. That altar of burnt offering was where it didn't, smoke didn't cease from going up before the Lord night and day. I know you see some of these artistic designs of the tabernacle and everything looks pristine, clean. Remember, we're out in the wilderness. Some of us can't even stand a camping trip for a week. It's like, hey, let me get back in my comfort zone here. They're out in the wilderness with all the possible things that could afflict people out there in the heat. And yet here stands this tabernacle that's been built now. And again, a lot of people like to imagine the priests there with pristine white garments on. Guess what? They look like a butcher shop. We have a bloody sacrifice that God required. You say, why bloody? Well, because of sin. If you ever question or wonder just how much our sin is an offense to God. Look what it required for God to justify, to sanctify his people. Nothing but the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're talking about for thousands of years. Bloodshed, 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 bloodshed. And then that smoke that arose up when they'd taken, put those sacrifices day and night, that that smoke ever arose before the Lord. You and I know that when you've got something burning like a house or something around you, you smell the smell. It smells smoky and it draws your attention to it. What on earth is burning? I can smell the smoke catches our attention. Well, this ought to catch our attention. The fact that this particular burnt offering altar of burnt offering was put right at the beginning at the entrance of the tabernacle where those that were outside could observe and see it they could see this smoke going up night and day representing God's justice representing his wrath 
but poured out on the sacrifice. The altar itself didn't burn up. That's a picture of the divinity of Christ. God didn't die when Christ laid down his life on the cross and bore the wrath of God. That altar was unaffected, but the sacrifice was burnt up. It was a complete sacrifice. So much so that when it was finished, there remained nothing but righteousness for God to impute to the account of his people. If you tell me, well, I don't think it's all right there. Well, guess what? You're as blind as a bat and worse. You've never read the scriptures. You've never had your eyes opened. And there's nothing that can be more condemning than for you to read that or see that and think, well, I still think that I'm justified when I believe or I'm sanctified by my efforts. Somehow this flesh is getting sinning less and less. Everybody's always talking about these things, but they don't have a clue because they're, they've never been lost. You won't hear a lost sinner talking that way. Any sinner that's ever been lost and the Lord has revealed Christ in, their one hope of glory is the work of Christ and that sacrifice and what he accomplished. So everything here is vital when Moses actually sets it up and anoints and consecrates the tabernacle and all its furnishing, as well as Aaron and his sons, following the detailed instruction by God. That's that section there that we read in verses 15 to 33. And uh, you'll see over and over again that phrase, as the Lord commanded. If you like to underline repeated words, that would be one to, to do right there in that, that portion from verse 15, 16 to 33, as the Lord commanded. How come it can't be any other way? There's a very popular author. And whenever I say this, everybody's going to come up after me and say, who are you talking about? I think I know who you're talking about. So put that out of your mind. There is a popular author that actually wrote in his book on what he called the atonement and said it was blasphemous to think that God couldn't have saved sinners in some other way. You know what? Take and burn that book. I don't care. That author, all of that needs to go on the ash heap. He missed it. No matter what he believed or taught about sovereignty and all these things, for a man to say that, that pretended to be able to serve God and say that it could have been done another way, he doesn't know God, didn't know God. He's gone now to his place, whatever that is, unless the Lord taught him later on. But think about it, as the Lord commanded, as the Lord commanded, what God purposed even before the foundation of the world was accomplished exactly as he commanded. And not one thing more or less was done under the sun, but what as he commanded. That's pretty clear there in the book of Acts. They didn't do, got Herod and Pilate. Everybody wants to know, well, who put Christ on the cross? God put his son on the cross because it was the only way that he could be ever satisfied and himself justified in how he saves sinners. I could preach a whole message on that one, but we got to move on. Verses 34 to 38 is the final portion, and I love this, the glory of God fell in that tabernacle. This wasn't just some empty structure model that you see in a museum and you go by and look and think, oh, that really looks intricate and detailed. Here's what is significant when you read in verse 34, notice then, the then words are important. People want to, Make it as if, well, God's not limited to time. He's not bound by time, you know, because he purposed the end from the beginning that it was all done before. No, then, everything done in its order. Then, a cloud covered the tent of the congregation. That's the presence of the Lord. You think that that cloud would have come if something had been out of place or undone? So that's what we see here in this third part. The glory of the Lord filling this tabernacle. After the tabernacle was set up, it's as if, like in the beginning with creation, God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was good. 
That's what I see the Lord doing here. Here's the tabernacle as he had ordered, ordained, set up. And from his throne, there in glory, looking and seeing. When it says here that the cloud covered the tent and congregation and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, this was Christ himself coming to this tabernacle because he is that cloud of glory. You say, well, I thought he didn't come until thousands of years later. That was in the flesh. That's what the tabernacle represented, but he wasn't absent. He was there with his father before the world began from everlasting to everlasting. The word was with God and the word was God. All throughout scripture, we find manifestations of Christ appearing and coming to his people. And that's what we see here in this cloud of glory. How glorious is it? It was so glorious that not even Moses could enter in. Moses was not able, verse 35, to enter in to the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon and the cloud and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. How foolish for any of us to think that somehow we have God figured out or Christ figured out. People say, well, all right, we've heard enough about Christ now. What else are we going to learn? You haven't heard enough about Christ. Not until that glory so fills your mind and heart you can hardly even enter in. That's when you know that the Lord's presence is there. It's not the hoop you do. I feel like the Lord's with me today. Go out, praise God. People shouting like that, they haven't heard a, a thing. They don't know a thing. I'd rather meet somebody that's bowed down and you ask them, well, what, what's weighing you down? The glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord. The very presence of Christ. Who am I that I should ever, ever enter in? I, I pray God I never get to a point where this becomes secondary. I know how the Lord dealt with me over 40 years ago. And I, you know what? I want that every day. Every time I get up, bow down. Seeking Christ, looking for him. And his glory being such that I could not enter in. It's so glorious. People talk about the glory of the Lord, but have no clue. But that's what we see here. And why did God bless it with his presence through his son? Well, because everything was exactly as he had ordered it. And so that was going to be essential even for the children of Israel as they moved from there on into the wilderness even further. It would be God's guidance through this cloud. And whenever it rested over the tabernacle, day and night, that's what it says there in uh, verse 36, when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. They didn't know how long they would be on the move, but they went as the Lord moved them. It's just like us today. We don't know how the Lord's going to direct our day. I have no clue. We have our plans, but it's the Lord to direct those things. But I know looking back, every detail, every curve and turn of the road, it's been the Lord guiding all the way. But if the cloud were not taken up, verse 37, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. Oh, that the Lord would grant us patience to wait on him. We all have in our hearts desires, what we would like to see the Lord do, accomplish. But you know what? A wish is just simply an unbeliever's prayer. When I hear people say, I wish this, or I wish that, guess what? That's an unbeliever's prayer. A prayer of one who is the Lord is to wait on him. If that cloud's not moving, we're not moving. If Christ isn't in it, like Moses is gonna, has already said there in Exodus 33, when he asked God to show him his glory, he said, if, if you don't go up with us, do not move us from here. I wonder if we, even here at this time, this meeting, have that sense and awe 
that he would not even move us out of this place unless he's pleased to go with us. I know we've got plans this afternoon. We're all looking forward to a good time later, but what if the Lord would not take his presence out with us and uh, you were to be conscious that I can't move unless he does? I wonder if we could just lay low at his feet. That's that's the greatest blessing of all right there, that these journeyed not. And you can see that cloud was everything. Verse 38, for the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day. There again is the blessing of Christ on that tabernacle, who he is. It was a fire by night and a cloud by day. I don't know if you've ever lived in a desert area, but it gets pretty cold at night. Where I grew up in Chad, Africa, it could be 120 degrees during the day and 55 degrees at night. And I'm telling you what, you were shaking in your bed at night, shivering, cold, just because of the temperature drop. And so for practical reasons, it was a fire by night, but it was also a reminder even at night of the Lord's presence. I don't know about you, but some of the darkest hours are at night when all is quiet and it's just you and the Lord. I know some people try to put it out of their mind. They don't want to have to deal with that. They'll turn up the radio, they'll run, watch a TV show or go do something so they don't have to think about it. Best thing at night is you have got nothing to do but think. And if the Lord has you flat on your back and... Uh, Put you through a dark time. But oh to see that cloud of fire. And to know that it represents God's justice, yes, but it doesn't, it's not consuming me. Why is that? That's the time to reflect on his mercy. And to know that though he's a consuming fire for others, for me, it's a light. And oh how I need that light. It's it's a warming of my soul at night and a cloud by day. What does a cloud do? It protects from the heat and sunshine. That's why we need Christ the mediator. Were we to have to deal with God directly without a mediator, we'd be consumed. But oh, the cloud, it not only gives us guidance, but it protects and keeps us. A lot more there we could look at, but what a blessed and glorious chapter to end this book here god's blueprint for worship hymn number 49 our great savior Let's... jesus what a friend for sinners jesus lover of my soul friends may fail me foes assail me he my Savior makes me whole. Alleluia, what a Savior. Alleluia, what a friend. Saving, helping, keeping, loving. He is with me to the end. Jesus, what a strength in weakness. Let me hide myself in him. Tempted, tried, and oft times failing, he my strength, my victory wins. Alleluia, what a Savior, alleluia, what a friend. Saving, helping, keeping, loving, he is with me to the end. Jesus, what a help in sorrow while the billows o'er me roll even when my heart is breaking he my come 
for helps my soul. Alleluia, what a Savior. Alleluia, what a friend. Saving, helping, keeping, loving. He is with me to the end. Jesus, what a guide and keeper while the tempest still is high. Storms about me night or takes me he my pilot hears my cry alleluia what a savior alleluia what a friend saving helping keeping loving he is with me to the end. Jesus, I do now receive him more than all in him I find. He hath granted me forgiveness. I am his and he is mine. Alleluia, what a Savior, Alleluia, what a friend, saving, helping, keeping, loving, He is with me to the end. The Lord's directed me just to read from a small portion of 1 Corinthians 5, it's not the normal passage that I would read from whenever we're about to partake of the Lord's table, but even as I was preaching there about the Passover and about that being the beginning, that being the anniversary, that being the birth date, you realize every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, it's an anniversary, it's a celebration of independence and of liberty for the Lord's people. Not something that we take lightly. We're not just going through a performance here and partaking of the bread and drinking the cup. And it's a ritual and we do it at the end of every month and so be it, no. It's an anniversary celebration. You know how that is when you have an anniversary, it's special. And uh, that's what this is to us. but. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there was some problem in the Corinthian church. When I say problem, there were a lot of problems. When people say to me, I wish we could get back to the New Testament church, I'm thinking, I don't want to go back there because there were an awful lot of conflicts. Things just like we can face today. But in the middle of one particular sin, if you will, that was exposed in the congregation of a man having his father's wife. It was such a case that it wasn't even named among Gentiles because they had some pretty wild things that they had out in the world. But even there, the spirit directed Paul to say this, this here wasn't anything like even the world would imagine right there in that congregation. Perversion. And he said, you're puffed up, have not rather mourned. You know, it's not a matter even mourning over somebody else's sin. It's, it's mourning over our own, recognizing that we're nothing but corruption and sinners in ourselves. And if the Lord doesn't keep his hand on us, we'd be the first candidates for hellfire, for separation from God. And yet... It's in the midst of that, dealing with that particular corruption that the Lord directed Paul to give us some instruction about what we're about right here. In 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 6, he says, your glorying is not good. 
know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And that's true of any type of deviation at all from what the scriptures teach us concerning Christ and his glory. It is leaven and it is to be purged out. That's why in the Old Testament, when the Passover was celebrated, it was a whole week of unleavened bread. Every bit of leaven was to be cleaned out of the houses. You say, what was that all about? Well, it's a reminder that just living in this world, we get dirty. We carry about in this flesh corruption. And so it's necessary for us to be sanctified before the Lord. How are we going to be sanctified? It's only going to be through the work of Christ. Just celebrating a week of unleavened bread did not sanctify the people. Had they done just that and gone and cleaned their houses and then that was it, it would be no different than the parable that the Lord gave of the man that the demon was chased out of him and yet the house left empty and the demon went out turned around for a while and then came back right to that house that had been empty and found it empty and brought in sevenfold worse than when he had left initially. And the latter end of that man, the scriptures say, is worse than the beginning. I fear not to be one who somehow sensing a little bit of sin here, sin there. I try to clean the house and I'm going to get rid of the leaven. But unless that house has been bought by the Lord Jesus Christ, if, unless the blood shed of the Lord Jesus Christ, for that house, the latter end of that person is going to be worse than the beginning. I believe it's every bit as much as what we read there in Hebrews 6 of somebody that came and sat and listened, tasted of the heavenly gift and yet went their way. They're condemned. You say, well, what's that all about? It's one thing to have the leaven removed, but apart from the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's not going to help you. That's why here, verse 7, Paul says, purge out therefore the old leaven. And I read that in the sense of purge out anything of the old leaven. That has to do with the law, legalism, trying to do the work yourself, purge it out that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. Well, how can we be unleavened? Read on, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. That's why we have here these two elements that the Lord has left us with regard to his person and his work. There is the unleavened bread. And if you're partaking, it means that the Lord has taught you something of the sinlessness of Christ. There's no sinless here. It's in Christ. And that this unleavened bread is marked with flames, fire. You can see it. It took the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ to create this new lump of which if you're one of those for whom he paid the debt, then that's speaking of you. That's why we don't want to go back to the old leaven and think that somehow back there, like some say, well, I understand Christ fulfilled it, but I think we still need to. When you hear but, that's a person there that needs to shut up because there's nothing back there that can help you if it's not in and by and through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, his sinless perfection, him coming and earning and establishing that righteousness necessary for, for God to be just. And then doing what? Laying down his life. See, that's what it says there, that Christ, who is our Passover, is, has been sacrificed. It takes the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. It takes the bloodshed, took his sinless perfection, but it took also his shed blood unto death. 
So next time you have time to read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, just don't read over it real quickly. Just pause there. That'd be one of those places if you're traveling, say, we're going to spend a little time there. Settle down and uh, may the Lord open your heart to see all of the work of Christ being what's necessary for me to be justified, be sanctified, and glorified in him. Gracious Father, as we come to partaking now of what you have given us of your son as a picture, his sinless perfection, his body that was broken, the unleavened bread, him being the bread of life, and yet at the same time the necessity of the cup of his shed blood, shed blood unto death. To understand that we're not justified just on the ground of or basis of, but by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. And uh, I pray that you would grant us that persuasion. But same time to thank you that if you have so taught us, oh, what rejoicing, oh, what joy to be found in him, not having our own righteousness, but that which is of you by him. And so we thank you, and as we partake, we give you the glory. In Christ's precious name, amen. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, 118. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but lost and for contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, Sorrow and love flow mingle down. Did there such love and sorrow meet? Or thorns compose so rich a crown? Were the whole realm of nature mine, yet were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my life. Amen. All right. <laughs>